Hi everyone, welcome to Classical Mechanics. I'm your instructor, Dr. T.J. Hammond. Uh, this is the lecture notes for Wednesday, September 23rd, and today we'll be continuing on Chapter 6, Calculus of Variations. So, uh, why are we covering this? Again, uh, up to now, Classical Mechanics has been formulated by Newton's Laws, which you learned probably back in high school. Uh, you had that um, every particle has some momentum, and this momentum is changed by a force, and the force gives the rate of change of this momentum, so F equals MA, or more precisely, F is equal to D by dt of P. Now, if you'll notice, F and P both have little arrows on top. That means that both force and uh, momentum, or acceleration, are vectors. What we're going to learn over the next few weeks is how to set up mechanics according to scalars, um, and that will be determined by the Lagrangian Hamiltonian mechanics. Uh, so a scalar in that, uh, that, you, that you probably know by now is uh, just some number. Um, an example of that is going to be something like potential energy, for example. Um, and so uh, what we'll be covering today is um, we'll be continuing with what we talked about on Monday's lecture. Um, and in fact, in the actual lecture, we'll be going through um, some of the examples uh, but we'll also talk today about Lagrange multipliers, which is what happens if there are constraints to the motion. So before we were kind of talking about what happens, you know, you have a particle going in a straight line. What happens if that can't uh, go actually in a straight line? What if it's on the surface of a sphere or something like that? Then we have to deal with these things called Lagrange multipliers, which allow us to deal with these constraints. So the daily assignment that's due Friday is read through example 6.3 and explain why it's important to choose the proper x and y. So example 6.3 actually has two parts to it. It's actually two examples. It's two different ways of setting up the same problem. And one of the ways is a simple way to do it, and one of the ways makes it very complicated. Um, and so this will just kind of help you understand uh, the necessity of setting up your problem properly. Um, okay. So on Monday's lecture, we got to Euler's equation. Uh, this is going to be what we use uh, very often for uh, um, Lagrangian mechanics. Um, it's that the first derivative or the partial derivative of our function with respect to our dependent variable y minus the full derivative uh, with respect to the independent variable x of the partial derivative of our function f with respect to uh, y prime, which is the first derivative of our dependent variable, this is equal to zero. This is Euler's equation, and this is what allows us uh, to create or to use Lagrangian mechanics. So if you remember how we got to this point, uh, this was a necessary condition for j, our functional, to have an extremum. This was just kind of a, a uh, kind of like a pontification or whatever, whatever this functional is, we don't know what it is. All we know is that we're going to say j needs to have an extremum. And in order for j to, to find this extremum of j, all we needed to do was set um, this Euler's equation equal to zero. Okay, so we don't have to solve for all j. We don't have to do that entire integral. We don't have to you know, calculate all that stuff. All we need to do is solve for this part that was inside the integral and set it equal to zero. And then that is a sufficient condition um, or a necessary condition for j to have an extremum. Um, okay, so we had started off with this brachistochrome problem. Uh, I will do this in class. I won't do that here. Um, but briefly, there's an Euler's equation in a second form, and it's if this function, um, if the function f doesn't explicitly depend on x, which is the dependent variable, or sorry, the independent variable, uh, then if that partial derivative of f with respect to x is equal to zero, then we get Euler's equation of the second form. And so you can read through your textbook to find out how this is derived, um, or you can just take my word for it that we call this the Euler's equation of the second form. But uh, what we get is uh, there's a partial derivative of f with respect to x, this independent variable, but we've just said that that's equal to zero. So it turns out that that's equal to zero, that we can just get rid of this. And then we have the full derivative um, with respect to the independent variable x of this f minus y prime df by dy prime. But if this thing is equal to zero, if its derivative is equal to zero, then that means that this part inside the brackets just has to be equal to a constant. And that's Euler's equation of the second form. Um, we'll be going through an example 
uh, which is understanding the shortest path of a straight line, and that's called a geodesic. Uh, so, as we as we saw before, what's this? What's the path of uh, you know the shortest path of a straight line? We said okay, we could add to the straight line some kind of like sinusoidal function, and we could show okay, well, the shortest path is if that sinusoidal function has a zero amplitude, and so that means that the shortest path is just a straight line. But what happens if the straight line is on the surface of some object, like a sphere? And so if you've ever noticed like what flight paths are, um, if you've ever looked at a map, so say if you're flying, you know, you haven't flown probably in six months or so, um, but back when you could fly, you might you might have flown, say, you know, from New York or something like that to Europe or something, and you'll notice that you fly over you know, the North Pole. And if you're looking at this uh, at this map, you say, oh, why am I flying over the North Pole when it seems like it's much shorter from New York to say Paris and it's a straight line here. But it turns out uh, you're not just flying on this flat surface, you're actually flying on a sphere. Um, and so it turns out that the shortest path instead of being on a straight line on this is actually gonna have this weird kind of loopy structure. And that's because um, it's called a geodesic of a sphere, and basically you're connecting a point on the sphere from here to here. And so when you project this on, say, a Mercator map uh, projection, then it makes it looks like it has these really weird shapes. Okay. So in lecture, we will actually prove this, um, uh, and so we'll be going through that as an example. Uh, we might not have time. It might even uh, take us till Friday. Uh, this example can be a little bit complicated. Okay, but for the lecture, we'll also be talking about Lagrange multiplier, multipliers, and so that's if Euler's equation has some constraint. Uh, so if we have some constraint, um, and so we'll just give this, some, this constraint some general function g, um, and so this general function g can depend on y, the independent variable, and x, the dependent variable, then we need to incorporate, incorporate this into Euler's equation. So we can do this by adding an undetermined multiplier to the constraint. And so the Euler's equation, what we had before, was written this way. So df by dy minus d by dx, di f by di y prime is equal to zero. But now we have this constraint. And so what we're going to say is we have the exact same equation, but plus this Lagrange multiplier, lambda x, and then the derivative of this generalized function g with respect to y is equal to zero. And what we're trying to figure out is what this Lagrange multiplier is. So uh, d, d, di g by di y, we'll be able to figure that out quickly. But what we need to know in order to solve this equation is what lambda of x is. And so that's called uh, a Lagrange multiplier. We will use that to solve the Dido problem. The Dido problem is a uh, Kind of a famous problem that this queen was exiled and she was given a plot of land that could be covered by uh, some cowhide and so what she did is she cut this cowhide into very very tiny little strips and then um, tied these strips together and then she ended up putting this out into a circle and said okay well um, instead of this just being you know something like say four feet by four feet or something like that she ended up making these really really thin strips and then gave us a really large perimeter and so the Dido problem um, is fairly famous. Um, and we'll do a modification of this Dido problem in that what we want to do is figure out what the largest area is uh, from this line. And this line extends from minus A to A. And it's bound at the bottom um, you know, in the straight line. And then we want to figure out what shape this takes in order to maximize this area. OK, and we'll complete the lecture by talking about the, the delta notation. Um, and so if you remember how we set up this problem, we had that uh, we had this differential j, and we had to take the derivative of j with respect to alpha. Um, and so we can actually simplify this notation by this delta notation. And so we define the delta of j as the partial derivative of j with respect to alpha, and then multiplied by this derivative alpha, or the, the differential alpha. And same thing with delta y is di y by di alpha times d alpha. And so that means that our extremum for this, uh, this condition for our extremum now is just delta j is equal to delta of this integral from x1 to x2 of our function integrating over dx. It's simply shorthand. It represents finding the extremum of the functional 
Um, it's just that we'll be using this notation in the future, and so uh, I just need to introduce this to you guys here. Okay, uh, so for uh, the actual lecture, we'll be covering these examples and be going through these in detail, um, and then we'll be going through more detail, uh, more examples on Friday, um, just so that you guys get some practice on how to use um, calculus of variations to solve these different problems.